Previously on HMPalmer.com, capturing the magic of the funny game of baseball, I tell the origin story of my relationship with a cat, and while Kate was a recovering true crime podcaster, I still don't understand the mass interest. This is The Palmer Files, episode 49, with Anthony Quintano, journalist, visual storyteller, photographer, and someone who's looking to and has made a mark. We discuss wanting to be behind the camera, getting noticed, volcanoes in the movie volcano, twisters in the movie twister, going to outer space, and so much more. Are you ready? Let's do the show. Hello and welcome to the Palmer Files. I'm your host, Jason Sturchik, also known as Agent Palmer, and on this 49th episode is visual storyteller, multimedia journalist, and photographer Anthony Quintano. Anthony's career is a distinguished one, having worked with or for NBC News, CNBC, MSNBC, ESPN, NBC Sports, Honolulu Civil Beat, and TD Bank, just to name a few. He's covered the Olympics, New Year's Eve from Times Square, countless conventions, a volcanic eruption, and so very much more. What you are about to hear is a discussion about Anthony's background and how he got into broadcasting and social media, how he fell in love with the idea of being behind the camera and where that has led him, including the unexpected title of journalist. We also discuss being versatile when it comes to taking photographs and capturing video, being obsessed with weather and being space nerds, going for the unique, being remembered, and so much more. Before we get going, remember that if you want to discuss this episode as you listen or afterwards, you can tweet me at Agent Palmer, my guest Anthony Quintano at Anthony Quintano, that's A-N-T-H-O-N-Y-Q-U-I-N-T-A-N-O, and this show at The Palmer Files. For all things Anthony, you can visit anthonyquintano.com, which along with the show notes for this episode will include links to Anthony's social media and his YouTube channel, as well as other curated content, including a spot where you can purchase some of his beautiful photographs. Email can be sent to this show at thepalmerfiles at gmail.com. So let's frame it up nice and get it all in focus. Anthony, you are a visual storyteller. Now, that's what you do. Have you always been a visual storyteller? It's a it's a good question. I have always been involved in visual storytelling, but I don't think I've ever actually had the title. It's my job title now. Okay. But I've been a visual storyteller since high school. Is it I mean I I've I've followed you on Twitter and and your accounts and stuff, so I know it's both static and moving pictures. Mm. Uh, But where did it start? So, so the visual story history for me was really stills. Stills when I was taking a photography class in high school. Okay. But when I graduated from college, actually even during college, I really determined that I wanted to do video and I wanted to be involved in television broadcast. And that was my that was my goal for a career. Okay. I wanted to be a video cameraman. I wanted to be the TV cameraman on a TV show or event production. And what, what happened was is I, I did this project at community college where I was tasked to edit anything together in video form. And I am a big fan of movies. I grew up with movies. I love film. But I don't like the process of film, <laughs> of, of motion pictures. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. It, it's a lot. It is a lot. And so we were tasked with this production where I had to edit together whatever I wanted. And so I picked a song and edited together all my favorite movies to Bon Jovi's Raise Your Hands okay. on the Slippery When Wet album. And I put together, I, I, I think at the time, there was no downloading movies. No. And ripping them or whatever. I had to go to Blockbuster and rent all these movies, <laughs> at least 20. Okay. And edit these videos together. Now, what are you editing them on? So it was a uh, nonlinear editing machine. It's an actual physical, like, uh, 
deck okay. that goes on your desk. It has two knobs, and there's two, I, I forget what they're called, but they were like giant VHS okay. decks. All right, yeah. So you put the, the video that you want to rip from in one and the video that you're editing on on another channel. So you have two tapes, and you literally have to set your in and out points and let the scene play out in order for it to edit or record. So in real time, like if you want it's, to cut 26 seconds, you're sitting through 26 seconds. It's a pain. <laughs> it used to be a very painstaking process. Sure. And it would definitely be something that would deter somebody from that kind of industry. <laughs> but I was hooked. I would spend late nights in the, in the university edit suite cutting this. I was obsessed with this project because I was having so much fun. And I was like, this must be what I want to do. And then uh, part of that was a TV production class, and I was obsessed with it. I was love. I loved being on camera. I loved controlling my shot, zooming in and out, and panning, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it was uh, at the time it was boring talk shows. But then what happened was, I went to SUNY Plattsburgh after community college, in very far upstate New York, and we had a TV, a class that was pure TV production. We had a full on studio, and your job was to show up and put on a, a show every day or every week, once a week. And that was my obsession is that class. I failed all my, my history class, my philosophy class, whatever other things I had to take. I couldn't stand them. I, 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 I would skip them. I was obsessed with my TV class. The one thing that really kicked my career off was that winter break. I ended up getting the opportunity through the college to be a, a runner on a T, it was a TNT summer uh, sorry not summer winter goodwill games okay and it was in lake placid new york and i was a runner basically a grunt grunt worker i had to do whatever they wanted right yeah. go get coffee pull cables coil equipment put equipment away whatever but i had access to all these professionals in the industry and i was learning stuff on this job that i never learned in any of the, the tv classes that i learned so i was hooked I worked so hard on that job. It was a week long. I was standing in snow that was up to my waist on a mountain covering skiers coming down the hill. Oh, it was a crazy event. And I impressed my uh, the, the person I reported to so much that uh, me and a few others were selected to continue doing freelance work on other event gigs beyond that. And so I went back to school for the next the spring semester and then failing out again and only only passing my TV class. But at this point, I'm like, I'm in. I'm in the industry. I'm getting this freelance work. Why do I need to keep going? <laughs> my father said, I'm not paying for school anymore. You're done. You're, you failed out. That's it. You, you wasted your chance. And so I actually, um, I ended up having to get a full-time job as a bank teller back then. And whenever I would get a freelance job, I would just take vacation time and go work this freelance. And so my next freelance job after that was working with ESPN. And I was like, holy crap, my second job freelancing. I'm here <laughs> working on a TV production crew for ESPN. It was a great outdoor games also in Lake Placid. Okay. Uh, it was really cool. Was, it, they actually don't do them anymore, but it was like, you know, lumberjacks, uh, axing wood, climbing trees in a rate. It was a pretty, really cool event. And I did that for a while. And then I ended up getting a lot, you know, New York city marathon. I was, I was working, but I was all doing it as like a utility, which is a, an assistant to a cameraman. Okay. So after the third year of doing this, it was starting to get a little frustrating because it was like, okay, well, how do I advance from here? Are you a bank teller for all th for most of these three years as well? Uh, no. I ended up taking a full time job as a lifeguard and doing that for a while. Obviously, only during the summers. Yeah. And then uh, I ended up getting. I was at, working at a movie theater as a cashier. I ended up getting a job um, at the Cheesecake Factory at some point. So you got all these of, odd jobs. Yeah, odd jobs to keep the 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 dream alive. Exactly, exactly. Because like I felt like if I uh, I couldn't survive. Obviously, I was I was still living at home with mom, um, and so I had to bring money in, but I didn't want to let my dream go. Although the woman that initially hired me for that um, that Lake Placid gig, the first one, told me. You'll never get a job as a cameraman. And I asked her why. She told me that directors, especially in remote production, event production, are very insecure and they love having all the same guys all the time because they know how they shoot, they know how they work, 
And it's it's one of those things that you just don't want to risk having a new guy come in and do it. And so I was I was really heartbroken about that. But they have so to have a, a new guy. I mean, those guys don't. But the, here's the thing is that it's all based on word of mouth. OK, so if the camera guy does bail on a gig, he's the one that usually provides the, the backup okay. to him. And they because they trust him, they'll take his word that this guy's good. It doesn't always work out. There are, you know, no, there sure. are guys. In, yeah. But but that was that was the frustration for me. And, and I didn't really know enough about the industry. So I ended up getting um, uh, my father had passed away around this time and had left me and my brother an inheritance. And I ended up using that money to buy my own equipment. I was like, hey, I'm going to prove that I'm a very good cameraman. And it, that was my argument with to her is like, well, how could I ever prove that I'm good if I can't get on a camera to begin with? Yeah. Okay. And so I ended up getting my own camera, my own editing system. Uh, this was the old Max, <laughs> like the, the, the translucent ones that you could see through and it was a big tower and the, yeah. Um, that was, uh, it was fun to have your own gear and be able to shoot what you want. So I actually ended up going out to like random local events and just filming B roll of things, anything that, um, newsworthy or whatever. And this is right around the time where YouTube started coming up and you know, this is social media, like MySpace, Friendster was a thing. So you've and got a so, platform, you have platforms for these B this stuff you're shooting. So the, the thing was, is like, okay, I have the equipment now, but how do I get people to see my stuff? Okay. So, so I, I learned about YouTube. And I was like, I got to get on there. I got to put out whatever I can so people can see my work. And Twitter ends up coming up right about this time. And so I, you know, whenever something newsworthy happens, I go and I try to capture like a news guy, except I'm not working for anybody but myself. Yeah. And uh, there was a point where I caught, so the the flight that crashed into the Hudson River. Yeah. Uh, U.S. Airways, I think it's 1545. I ended up catching the transport of the fuselage out of New York city and ended up passing our apartment and uh, I ended up getting video of it and I tweeted it out and it went viral. I was getting requests from media outlets in Europe and I was, I was like, Holy crap, my mind's blown. And it wasn't video itself. It was the whole concept of social media and the fact that I could reach so many people. Yeah. Uh, and all of a sudden I'm getting all these followers and I'm like, Holy cow. So now it's like, why do I need to go work for anybody yeah, <laughs> anywhere else? But yeah, eventually, because of, I ended up building my own following uh, and continued to do that kind of work, I ended up getting a still camera in addition to my video camera. And so I'm doing both now. So whenever I go to a newsworthy event, I'm shooting stills and video. I tried the whole wedding thing for a year and I hated it. <laughs> but now, during that time, it was funny because I would, I would do a wedding video and I would design and take photos for the DVD cover because back then you had to give people DVDs yeah. of their wedding. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so strange that that's a pass now, but, uh, that's what really got me into still photography again. And I actually, I was torn because I was doing both and I really love both, but the still photography was really catching on personally. And so at some point I ended up getting my full-time job at NBC news. Much of it was because over the years, I had built up experience being a videographer, video editor, a photographer, knowing how to live stream and understanding social media. And ended up, I had that time, I had like 8,000 followers on Twitter. And, and that back then, it's like, holy, you know, yeah, you're that's a huge following back then. Sure. Early days. And he's and he was impressed because I had built all that on my own. And it was funny because the the first night I went to go meet the uh, director of social media for NBC news. Uh, I had ended up tweeting at him because I saw he got the job as the first person with social media as a position. And I tweeted, I instantly tweeted at him and said, I would love to meet. I've been doing social media. I had actually been freelancing for CNBC around that time. And so I was involved with, with the, the company. And so he invited me in and they had this, this live show plan the same night I was meeting him. And so after we had our meeting, he invited me to come hang out while they taped. They did a live stream and they couldn't get their live stream to work. And so I jump in and actually get their live stream working again. And so that was it. Boom. I had the job. Um, and then uh, it took like six months of 
creating the position or whatever, but I was the first uh, social media manager for NBC News. So I want to ask, because obviously there's a huge difference between still and moving uh, as far as pictures and stuff. As an outsider, I guess, as, as a writer who I will use pictures when I need to to accentuate my words, is there an actual internal struggle for like, I, I want to be just uh uh still or just moving like like can we all get along or do you need to have a specialty like oh i do video or oh i do you know you know photography right like can can we all get along or do you have to have your your expertise well i don't know what you mean by get along well it just feels like people have to make a decision right like i'm 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 a film guy you don't okay you don't so here's the thing uh and, and it's going to be interesting in the in the next couple of years, but it's so easy to record video now. You don't need a huge camera. Like it was impossible back then because the cameras are huge for video. And now it's your phone. Yeah. You don't you don't need a, a fancy camera anymore. It depends on what you want to do. But um, I actually put a hot shoe uh, on the hot shoe, a, a little uh, phone mount, and I have my phone recording video. While I'm taking stills. Okay. So right? a, a little both. I, you can't, you, these days, if you're a photographer, you have to do video. If you want to be, get your name out there and get your work out there, you have to be versatile. It's, it's unfortunately where the industry is going or, or it, it currently is. Yeah. <clears throat> where you, in order to brand yourself and market yourself and get out there, you need to be doing video. You need to be doing time lapses. You need to be doing stills. Uh, you can't just do one thing. There are people who do, and they choose, you know, to be pure. And I'm a pure photographer. It's great, but you're limiting yourself. If you, it all depends. If you don't care about the, you know, reach and following, uh, that's fine. Keep doing what you're doing. If that's your love, stick with it. Uh, and it's good to do that. It's good to focus on the one thing because you can perfect it. I feel like I, a stress and anxiety whenever I'm out there, because there are moments where I still have to decide, do I want to focus on taking pictures or video of a moment? Because there's certain things that you just can't do both. Okay. Uh, good example is the solar eclipse that I just photographed. Yeah. You can't photograph that or video it with a phone because it's the sun's too far away. I would need a really big lens like the one I'm shooting with stills. Now my still camera that I have tied to this giant lens does both. It records video and stills, but it doesn't do it at the same time. Yeah. So what could I do? Now, here's the problem. I'm on a boat with a giant <laughs> lens. That boat is not still. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I'm going to be going up and down, up and down with the waves. That's not going to be a very pleasing video for the audience. So I've made a decision. I'm going to focus. I recorded video on my phone that was behind the scenes with my phone. Okay. You know, like us getting out there, getting into position, what it looked like just before. Then... As soon as the sun started coming up, I focused on the stills until until it was at a point where we we weren't in a, you know getting good shots anymore. And so then I go back to the video a little bit. So that's that was you know it's always a battle in my mind to decide what I'm going to do. But camera, there's a point, and it's still a discussion. There's going to be a point where the frame rates in video are so high that you're going to be able to pull a frame that is high res as a still. Yeah, I mean, taken. yeah, we're we're pretty close to that. And then you, I mean, I guess from the little I do dabble in for photography, I will say I think the eye of a camera person, regardless of what, what kind of camera, the eye is something that you you don't learn, you just accrue. Th through yep. experience because you can't teach that no because like even when we get to a point where okay there's a the future you know 50 years in the future there's a five minute eclipse and you can take all five minutes of video and then you can pull any frame you want but i'm ha like i i you if you gave me all of those frames and whatever the frame rate is in 50 years i would just be like i, I don't know these these 50 look okay from this, you know, two minutes. Like I, and I, I don't know how 
<laughs> you there's do also it. a look when you when you're shooting video you can't achieve a certain look in a freeze frame of a video than you would with a still photo for instance the motion blur long exposure this is like can't the, yeah i mean the example being what the the desert shots where you see the stars uh, except a, with the trail yep. the light trails which is long exposure uh, yeah, there's certain things you still cannot achieve with a video camera when it comes to stills. Okay. Um, video cameras are still awful at night. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, if you have a good still camera that has the ability to take a long exposure, that's your goal. And that's, so that's what they're doing at night now, you know, is time lapses. So you still, you, you, you can build, you can take stills to the point where you have a video. Speaking of you know, video and, and, and movement you and, and uh, uh, just from following you on Twitter, it feels like there's a part of you that wants to be a storm chaser. Now, is it just that you have like an interest in it or do you like, like, is it like an interest from afar? Like I like the movie Twister as much as maybe the next guy or maybe more than that, but I don't want to go there. (laughs) I've been obsessed with weather since I was a kid. I've been obsessed with lightning, with snow, any kind of storm activity I've been obsessed with before Twister existed. Okay. Again, that was just obsession with weather. When I saw Twister, I was obsessed. I was like, I need to see it. I still am. I still have yet to see a tornado in real life. Have you, have you, have you gone on a storm chase? Oh, yeah. Let me tell you. It is not easy. See, it, they make it look easy. They, well, they it make it look not. like anytime you go out, there's going to be one. Like you no. might not be close, but you'll see it. No, it is not easy. And when you're out there, it could be an entire, you know, when a tornado pops up on the radar all of a sudden, yeah, it could be in a whole nother state and you'd have to drive three hours to get to, in order to get it's, there's no way to know. I mean, if we knew where tornadoes were going to drop, we would, well, protect people and be safe. Sure. We don't. And because of that, it makes it really hard to chase. Now, we've gotten really good to kind of get a general. And there's some chasers who do this for a living who know where the have a really good idea. But I know some of the best chasers, Reed Timmer is one of the best chasers I know out there. And he still has days where he misses stuff. Uh, or or, you know, he didn't it didn't the storm didn't pan out the way they thought it was gonna be. So it's it's not a perfect thing. But you could go on one of these tours for tornadoes, and there's a good chance you'll see something. Um, I I tried it a couple of times where I would I I would go in, in my own vehicle and follow them. Okay. I can't I can't keep up. I would lose them, and then I would have to go off on my own. I still to this day, I, I I got fresh. I had a bad experience in Colorado with some other chasers. And I think at that point, I was like, you know what? This is not, it's not, I don't know enough. You really need to be a meteorologist or understand meteorology to do it safely. And uh, I don't know enough to to do it that way. And so I figure I'm going to let the pros do it. I'll look from a distance. Maybe one day I'll sign up to one of those tornado tours and uh, and be a tourist. But uh, I tried doing it myself. A couple of times I caught some good, great storm cells, which are, I mean, I tell you the weather out there in the plains is just surreal. Uh, and we catch a glimpse of it every once in a while here. We just had some amazing shelf clouds come through the New York city area. So I can still do it on, in my backyard when this, I say, I'm not going to chase them anymore, but if they come to me, I'm going to be out there in okay. it. Okay. <laughs> All right. I mean, cause I, but I love weather. I'll, you'll see me. Even when I'm not chasing, I'm tweeting about weather, uh, and I'm and I'll share other people's work whenever they capture amazing stuff. Is there so you? I know a little bit about your career f- from post NBC, where you have basically traversed North America all the way to Hawaii and back, you know, for various jobs and this that. But I mean, you travel in the meantime as well. Is there? Like, I feel like you're across all mediums. You've done multitudes of different stories. Like, is there is there one story that or or event that you have covered from your career that, like, stands above the rest? The ultimate peak of my career 
an experience is covering the volcanic eruption in 2018 in Hawaii. Okay. It was life changing for me. And after covering that event, I actually said to my wife, I'm depressed. I'm depressed because I don't know what would be more interesting than this. But you didn't know. I mean, okay. But I will say this. Before that event, you didn't know that covering a volcano would be the high point. Nope. So there's a chance we you just don't know what the next high point is. Yes, but I've I've set the bar in saying <laughs> that my next my peak, my next bar on that uh bucket list is going to space and photographing Earth from it, from the space station. Is that is that the next the ne- that's the next peak for you? It's the next peak that I know I will never get to. I I, uh, I don't know. Never is a strong word. I mean, it, it, look, in the next in the next decade, I expect that at the very least costs will go down and there will be journalists going up for free. So fingers crossed. I I I hope I am an old man who gets to go up before his, you know, he's on his deathbed <laughs> and gets to do my dream. I love space too. And, and so it, I, even as a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. I just was never smart enough. <laughs> no, I, no, I look, I never I was, even tried. I mean, at the very least you and I are, it, we're, we're kind of in agreement there. Like I, I wanted to be an aerospace engineer cause I did not have the, I didn't, I knew enough about myself to know, like, I didn't want to go. But I wanted to be around those people and around those things. And when you talk about gadgets, like, I don't know. Like, no, it's not a gadget. But is there anything cooler than a Saturn V? Like, yeah, we've seen the space shuttle and we've seen, you know, what what Blue Origin and, you know, SpaceX. No, I'm sorry. In my head, you're you're still not any better than what we took to the moon. I have to exactly I- I have to say, I'm not a fan of these rockets. I want it. If I'm going to go up, I want to go up in a shuttle. I miss the shuttles. Yeah. And I miss seeing them launch. Uh, you know, watching these rockets launch is just not as impressive as watching the space shuttles <laughs> launch. Um, but uh, that's it for space shuttles. Un- until they build whatever we're going to build to go to Mars, um, which I think we we're seeing now, right, is the uh, the big silver bullet yeah. thing. Yeah. I don't know the name of it. <laughs> yeah, well, the, uh, the names. The, there's so many names coming at us all at once, and and the other thing is, I understand the the concept behind these rockets, but and and look, being a space nerd kind of colors the lens a little bit as as we see these things. But knowing that we're just getting back. To powerful rockets that took us to the moon 50 years ago soon 60 years ago soon seven like we're we're so far removed and yet in all this time we're now coming back to yeah. this and it's what's nice is that we're at a much faster pace i feel like uh i mean spacex is throwing up rockets left and right uh yeah it's it's the pace of things is so much quicker than back back in the early days you know, they're, you know, us going to the moon and then building, building something on the moon to then go to Mars. Yeah. Um, leaves that open opportunity where you're right. I might be able to take a bus to the moon and shoot Earth from the moon. Well, who knows? W- w- I mean, OK, so you you have your choice, space station or the moon. I, I mean, I would, do, I would still do this. I would still do the space station. Yeah. Yeah. The moon just seems boring to me. You know, I mean, the the, the idea that, you know would be cool to be on another, another object in space. Okay. That isn't man-made, but the, the, the closeness of the space station, like being able to see detail uh, of the planet from that distance is what, what makes me want to go to the, the space station and the moon. Yeah. I, I think I could see that. I feel like you're, it's, it's one of those things where you go to the moon either because you're interested in the moon Right. Or because you want to see the Earth rise, and once you've seen the Earth rise, you've seen the Earth rise. Whereas in you know high Earth orbit or wherever the you know space station is, you get to see mm-hmm. the New York at night. You get to see exactly. Sydney at night. You get to see them during the day. Like you, yeah, get- the moon's too far. The moon's too far, and it's it's a ball of dust. 
it's just like, eh. you know, you're there for an hour. It's like, okay, I've done. I'm, you know, I want to go back. <laughs> that would totally be my attitude. Like I'd totally take this big, amazing moment and be like, okay. All right, um, I'm done. <laughs> what's next? Let's go to Mars. Well, on more terrestrial grounds, right? Um, you know, hopefully one day from a safe distance, you will get your twister. But aside from that, is there an event that you haven't covered that you would like to? Hmm, that's a good question. Like, I mean, you've been to like almost every convention that could ever be. Um, are, ne- are you talking about like a weather event or are you talking about a no, just any event in general? Event, like, oh, that's a good question. Um, no, uh, I want to just cover volcanic eruptions. Okay. The ne- that's the, the, so I've, I've covered the Super Bowl. Okay. I've covered, I haven't covered the Oscars, but I've been outside the Oscars when it was going on. Um, I'm, I have no interest in baseball or world series. I'm not a baseball fan. So yeah, I mean, I've, I've kind of done all the, the big event stuff. Uh, but as far as natural, like that's the most amazing thing. That was what made me awestruck about the volcanic eruption is that, this is this is this is how we started. This is what we were made of. And to see it happening in front of your eyes and and how powerful it felt, uh, like all the things I was feeling, like the rumbling under the ground under my feet, the the heat, I was awestruck of the power. I felt so little when I was covering when I was standing in front of the volcano and all this lava was flying around me. I was like, if I I I'd die a happy man at that moment (laughs) Uh, because it was just so amazing to see life happen like that. Now, you were already in Hawaii at that point, right? Mm -hmm. You didn't go for that. You happened to be there. I moved to Hawaii in 2015 to take a job at a nonprofit newsroom as their social media person. Again, any job that I took as a social media person, they also utilized my skills as a photographer and a videographer to create content. Yeah. And so I was able to go out and report on stories and stuff like that. And so what's funny is, is when the eruption, so the eruption happened in 2018 and it was on the big Island, not Oahu where I was living. And I was actually on vacation when the eruption started. I was, uh, I was in Yosemite at the time and uh, watching it on social media. I'm like, Oh my God, I can't believe I'm not there. And we come home uh, to Oahu, and my wife says, "You're going to jump on a plane to go to the Big Island, aren't you?" And it's like, and this is like on a weekend, so my editor, my editors aren't going to send me. So the the thing about Civil Beat, the newsroom I was working for, is that they don't cover breaking news; uh, they're investigative. Okay. So they had no interest in covering the eruption, but I went on my own on the weekend to go see what I could see, and I get there. And so, it, so what the way it was working was, is it's not your traditional volcanic eruption. It's, you know, one not you know everyone thinks it's all it's always one big mountain and the top blows off. This was very different. This was a multiple openings in the ground coming up and spewing lava. So can, you know, picture a crack opening in the ground. Yep. And just lava shooting out, and eventually that lava ends up forming a cone, which looks like what your traditional volcano would look like. And multiple. And there was, I think, 25 fissures that opened up. So by the time we landed, um, it was up to number 15. And the day I got to the big island, they all stopped. (laughs) And I was like, just my (laughs) luck. Everything stopped. And I was like, this is it. There's nothing's going to happen. So I go to bed and I wake up the next morning. A fissure opened up. Somebody's live streaming it on Facebook. I'm following it closely. I'm like, oh my God, thank God. <laughs> and I and the guy posted the coordinates in that thing. It's like, perfect. I can go in and see it. So I ended up finding the coordinates and we were literally all in this open cow pasture where this fish is just going off in the middle of the woods. And that was it. We were like 10 feet from moving lava. <laughs> How, wh- wh- are you a daredevil? Like where, like, cause, cause if you told me, right, like a fissure's going to open up a mile from your house, where do you want to be? 
I, I would probably not go closer to it personally. I think I, it's funny. My wife asked me the same question. It's like, <laughs> why do you do this? Why do you do all these death to find? I think it's the uniqueness. It's the fact that you and everybody else are scared to go to it. I don't want to be where a hundred other people are taking photos. I want to be where I'm taking a photo and I'm the only one that took that photo. Okay. It's the uniqueness of the, of it. It's not so much the danger. It scares the crap out of me. Okay. All it, right. I was scared to death, but it was the fact that, oh my God, I'm going to be one of like six other people that has a photo or video of this. It's, it's, it was historical to cover this eruption. And so I'm part of history at this moment. And so that, that's just like all going through my head. I was like, I got to, I got to capture this because that's, that's really my, my goal in life is to have made an impact in some way, uh, affected history in some form so that I'm somehow remembered when I'm gone. Um, I want to have a legacy. Okay. I'm not, I'm not trying to like save the world or cure anything or anything like that. But the thing that after the eruption that happened that I didn't know was going to happen <laughs> is my name was mentioned on the Senate floor for my coverage of the volcano. Uh, Senator Maisie Hirono listed out a bunch of names of news uh, organizations that were covering the volcano and then singled my, my name out for live streaming it because of all the people I was helping by streaming the volcano. So they knew where it was, what was happening. That they knew every from every moment what was happening because of the live stream. Uh, we managed to find a house that was at a safe place. It was uphill. Uh, <clears throat> there was nothing remotely close to erupting around it uh every time i filmed it everyone thought it was very close but it was actually at least a mile mile and a half away but we were just we had zoom lenses so it made it look a lot closer uh, but we had a house with power and internet it was like the most perfect situation <laughs> we were watching all these volcanoes open up and we're chilling in the living room watching this all go off i have a video on my youtube channel uh of me in the living room with the other photographer that's staying with me and we're like Holy crap, we're just sitting here and you literally look out the window and there's this erupting fissure right there. <laughs> and it's so it was so surreal. We couldn't sleep the first couple of nights because there was a gas explosion from the volcano every like five minutes. And that explosion was it, it was it would shutter the window. Like you would you would see the window bow from the explosion. And we were we actually taped the windows because I thought the windows were going to break from the explosions. Now was it was it the force or the sound or both? Both. Both. So cuz cuz look, I mean we talk about Twister and like you don't go find a tornado every time you go out. Volcanoes, it's one big thing and that's it. Like you you don't and maybe some earthquakes associated with it. You don't hear about any of that other stuff. Uh in in you know, in the movies, right? Like no, and this was some, and this was unlike what you saw in the movies. Like, because, like you said, all you see. Actually, I'm wrong. The movie Volcano, um, the one with Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones. Okay, that wasn't. That was a fissure that okay. opens up in in L.A. Okay, it wasn't your traditional volcano, and then ended up building into this cone. That's exactly what we were experiencing in Fisher, except instead of just one, we were dealing with twenty five. Yeah. Well, I, and, and instead of it being LA, like it's, it, it would, you know, it was, it was in a residential area. So okay. an entire neighborhood was wiped out. Um, it wasn't, you know, a city, uh, you're talking about, you know, small homes, trailers, stuff like that. But there was a full, full neighborhood where people were living. The good thing is, is that the eruption was happening at such a slow pace that people were evacuating when the cracks were forming. Cracks were forming under people's houses. People's houses were falling into these cracks uh, before the lava started coming up. Now, all right, so so this is my general ignorance showing, I guess, but do people, and look, I've lived in the Northeast for my entire life. So do people in Hawaii kind of understand volcanoes just like people on the plains understand tornadoes and while you may not know when or what you know what the signs are and like when to leave not everybody okay not everybody because there's a lot of white people that move to hawaii and i call them white people because they're not native hawaiian yep native hawaiians know it very well okay 
or even people who've lived on the Big Island for a, man, a long amount of years, not just Native Hawaiians. It's the people who've moved there probably in a year or two because it's, you know, the Big Island and living on these areas in the Big Island, they're, they're, there's older lava there from previous eruptions. So a lot of that land is very cheap. So it's very appealing for people to live, you know, go live in paradise. You can buy your own land here and put your own house or whatever. So a lot of people will just come after vacationing and end up buying a house there. And those are the people who did not know what was going on or how it was going to happen. I met a few of those people. Um, and then there's the people who knew right away that the cracks, the fissures, you become, you learn about it. When you move there, you start to learn about it. You hear about the early eruptions. Um, you have to get insurance for this, obviously. So I'm sure at that point is where you start discovering. It's actually, I'm, I'm guessing it could it, happen. Is it actually called volcano insurance? I don't know exactly what it's called. Okay. I, uh, I don't. Uh, um, it's possible, but I don't know. Okay. I, I just. But I do know that some people did not have insurance and lost everything. See, because for me, right, I live within, I've lived in eastern or northeastern Pennsylvania for mo my entire life, basically. And I've been, I've traveled elsewhere, but this is where I am. So a blizzard. When Hurricane Hurricane Sandy was my first hurricane, right? Like, you know, um, but other than that, it's been blizzards. I know nothing of tornadoes. We, You know, there have been a few within 50 miles out here. of late, but, you know, not not crazy like that. And, you know, volcanoes are foreign to me. You know, that might as well that might as well be Mars as far as my universe here. Right. <laughs> and And so <laughs> to you me, you might get an earthquake, though. Well, I, I remember, I remember what is it? Uh, man, what t uh, my memory's going to be bad now. I think it was 2011, 2012. We had a, we had a, like a two point, we had enough to make you feel like it was an earthquake. Now everybody out West was like, that's not an earthquake, yep. but we don't as, as a, for a place that doesn't get one anytime the ground moves, it's, it's of note. Um, so I, I remember that, but like for me, all of this is so foreign. <laughs> um, Absolutely. And unlike you, I'm 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 going the other direction, probably. Like I'm not, <laughs> I'm not I'm not going there. Well, that's it's funny because everyone now knows that I'm I'm a death defying photographer. That when the end of the world comes, I'm going to be out there filming it and not running to a shelter. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you've been fair. Like you know, you were you weren't. You weren't, you know, roasting marshmallows on the lava, right? Like there was a, you were a safe distance away. So, and I don't just do it to go take a picture either. After being a journalist and working with news organizations for 10 years, I've learned the value of information and providing that information. And so what I do is try to help inform people in an emergency. So when I do do this stuff, like in a storm, if some if I'm chasing and I see something and nobody else is around, I report it so that people know what's going on. Uh, a lot of people found it very helpful to, there were a lot of people whose homes weren't, were question marks. Like they left and their house was still there. A lot of people wanted to know, was their property damaged during the eruption? Can you check on us? You know, hey, uh, is my house still there? Can you get some pictures of it or whatever? You know, those kinds of little things were, were helpful to people. I mean, we, we talked a lot about your, I, I guess, the, the media um, background. The journalism thing, I mean, you didn't go to school for that. And even if you did, those were not classes you were attending. So how does the journalism kind of take hold? I mean, obviously you're working within the media, but you're not, you know, there's a progression that you've made into being a journalist just by quote unquote learn by doing right like i used to ask my boss this at nbc news because i i was really intrigued by who the you know the reporters and the journalists i was working with and what would happen is is when i would go out and and capture something while working at nbc news people started calling me a journalist and i was like am i a journalist <laughs> is and then i started thinking like don't I have to go to school and get like certified? Is there a plaque or something that says I'm a journalist? There isn't, there is no, anybody's a journalist. You're a journalist by interviewing me. And so, uh, 
it, it's very it's a very broad title. Journalists are storytellers. Uh, there are people who write books. There are people who who tell you know uh, audio stories and stuff like that. So it's a big spectrum. And because I report to inform, I'm a part of that world. Uh, I did not, and I tell that to people all the time. It's like, look, I didn't go to journalism school. I didn't study journalism, but I, I've done reporting. I've helped people. I've shared their stories, and I still do that to this day. That makes me a journalist. Currently, I'm not an accredited journalist, meaning I don't work for an accredited news organization, um, which I can't go and I don't have the access that a journalist has who works for CNN or NBC News now. So that really m makes the difference. If I mean, you've you've worked for bigger organizations throughout your career. If you had if, if I were to say, you know, you get to go back 20 years, but you're starting over. Would you would you stay freelance? Would you would more often? Because obviously now that's a path that's actually more viable than it ever was. Um, or would you kind of, you know, see what opportunities came? I, for, for the longest time, I wanted to work for myself. I, I had a hard time working for other people. And I struggled with that a lot. And so when I left Hawaii, I left without a job to go to. And my hope was, coming off of everything I did in Hawaii, that I'd be able to do um, freelance and live off of it. I've learned it's not that easy and it is no, it is so insecure uh, that it, it just, it was, it was scarier to become poor and almost homeless than to work full time. And so I learned that I couldn't make it work. Uh, I tried it and I, it got a little too scary for me uh, and my wife. And so uh, I gave it my best shot out in Colorado. And that's why we moved to New Jersey or back to New Jersey is because I ended up getting this full-time job now with TD. Uh, and thank God I did because then COVID started. <laughs> and if I was attempting to do freelance during that, I would we would have been on the streets. And that is not a good time. No. To be on the streets. No. So yeah, so I, I I took my ego down from the clouds thinking that I could go out on my own and do this and I couldn't. There are people who can. There are people who make it work. They do they hustle like crazy. Um, they work twenty four hours a day trying to make it work. And that's the thing is like I I don't really wanna I'm getting older. <laughs> I I don't wanna be working endlessly. And there's guys who camera guys that I know who go from one country to the other, one location to the other, one news story to the other. They don't go home. They don't have homes. They just live out on the road. And that's the life they love and they choose. And I, you know, they started that way and they they make it work. That I like the breaks. I like being able to do what I want to do. And so working full time has allowed me to, you know, I was able to photograph the solar clips and still hold a full time job. Okay. And so that's kind of uh the, my reality. It's much more secure, uh, a lot more security in, in doing it this way. People in, in, in my experience. Um, so I've been, I've been unemployed for almost two years now. Uh, I never took vacations. So here's all my savings going to keeping me living at a moderate lifestyle, I guess. Um, but one of the interesting things was because I have a blog, because I was interested in podcasting and because I have a, a business, which is just a side hustle. My first six months of unemployment when I was networking with people who knew any little bit of all that went, why don't you do it on your own? Why don't you why, why don't you make your side hustle your full time hustle? And 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 for me. Um, it's not the work that's the problem. Like it's not the, the putting pen to paper. It's, it's the hustle. That's the pro I, I, I cannot sell myself. I am a horrible, if you give me a job, I will do the hell out of that job. But I'm also not, uh, 
going to go out and find that it's not, like i'm so so when you talk about security oh my god like that i i i'm with you a hundred percent like yes being your own boss is cool but you know what else is cool knowing that next week the pay is the same as this week yep and there are times where it it takes away from my dream like i want to be in iceland covering the volcanic eruption there right now and if i had the resources i would be living there documenting that eruption like i did in hawaii I don't have those resources. And then on top of it, Iceland's not letting people live, or they are now. Um, it's just too uh, expensive to travel there for me. Um, but, but because can you I work can't... from anywhere right now, though, like if, if you did, like, I get, kind I, of. you know, if the, if the last few years hadn't been um, rough and, and you were in a better financial place, could you still work and like, you know, temporarily go there during the eruption? Well, technically, right now, I could take vacation time and go. Okay. And technically, I have the money to do it. Uh, so I have no excuse at the moment. I could go for like a week and, and cover it. Um, my problem is, I think the other thing is the uniqueness. There's been hundreds, thousands of people who have been able to go to that volcano from the last month or two. And so it's kind of been beaten to death. And so if I go, my stuff isn't going to be nearly as interesting as the stuff that, uh, you know, that's already been done. Okay. <clears throat> and that, that's kind of what takes away the, the desire a little bit for me. Um, because you know, it's one thing to take something for yourself. It's another thing to know that you've taken something that other people appreciate. And yeah, sure. I could document it my own way and make it unique in that form, <clears throat> but it's a very expensive trip. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of money to go and do that. And we're still, we still have a lot of debt to pay down from our, our year of unemployment in Colorado. <laughs> Is there like, okay. So what do you do for fun then? Because like all of this is passion and it's work and it's not by any stretch easy. You know, it might be fun to go out on a boat and shoot an eclipse, but I'm not going to call that easy. So like, what do you do for fun? That is my fun. Okay. It is it, being able to go on an adventure like that is my fun. Um, me sitting on a beach for a day is not fun. Um, I've gotten so used to not hanging out with other people. So going out to a bar, not th nothing of interest to me. Uh, even hanging around other people, not interest <laughs> to me. Um, I want to see things that I haven't seen before. I want to discover. I want to be out hiking to uh, a location I've never seen that's scenic. I want to travel. Traveling is fun for me. And then documenting that travel. I do have to confess to having a tinge of envy when it comes to Anthony's singular focus of the one thing he wanted to be. That he achieved it is something else, because his journey, as you have heard, has not been linear, but he was able to do what he wanted, and from there, he survived and evolved into other roles and positions, but that first one singular drive, I do envy that. The ability and drive to go after it is one thing and is definitely a requirement for achievement. However, the first step is to know what you want. And that is something I struggle with because for me, it isn't singular or it never appears to be. And so I'm always pushing myself towards something while being pulled in other interesting directions only to be moved again, like an untethered boat on the sea adrift. A few episodes ago, I postulated that perhaps we all end up where we are supposed to, which would explain why Anthony who is not a daredevil, still wants to go that extra mile to cover newsworthy happenings, even if it means chasing tornadoes or reporting from the lava flows of an active volcano. He is every bit the cameraman he always wanted to be. So perhaps, even though I don't have a definitive direction or goal, I should keep striving forward as the wind of my mind blows, because if I don't move at all, I can't arrive anywhere. And if I'm going to believe all of that, then why not believe in the idea that, 
and I got this from an odd song called River is Cried. In the desert, more things are named after water. If you name it, maybe it will appear. So I'm going to start naming where or what I want to be, even if it's going to change. And I urge you to do the same, whether you are adrift and know it like I am, or you don't. Thanks for listening to The Palmer Files, episode 49. As a reminder, all links are available in the show notes. And now for the official business. The Palmer Files releases every two weeks on Tuesdays. If you are still listening, I encourage you to join the discussion. You can tweet me at Agent Palmer, my guest Anthony Quintano at Anthony Quintano. That's A-N-T-H-O-N-Y-Q-U-I-N-T-A-N-O. And this show at The Palmer Files. For all things Anthony, you can visit anthonyquintano.com, which along with the show notes for this episode will include links to Anthony's YouTube channel, as well as his socials and other curated content, including a spot where you can purchase some of his photos. Email can be sent to this show at thepalmerfiles at gmail.com. And as always, your home for all things Agent Palmer is agentpalmer.com. Anthony, do you have one final question for me? Why do you podcast? So it it's weird because um I know why I started the podcast. Which is it it was a it was it was time, you know, I had been guesting on everybody else's shows, it was time to do my own thing. But of late I've been thinking, you know, my blog turns 10 this year. This podcast is going to turn two. For me, I've started to think about that question in terms of why I continue to podcast. And it is fun. I Like, it's fun. But I don't quantify that as a reason to keep doing something. And I still continue to do it, and I don't know why. I'm... I'm <laughs> Uh, the, 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 why may be my Holy grail. Um, I, you know, cause I, I guess I can easily go, why have I been blogging for 10 years? And I, I, I enjoy it. Like I enjoy the writing process. I enjoy some of the research I do. You know, I enjoy reading the books that I review and, you know, occasionally I'll do deeper dives and that research is fun. But why do I continue to do it? Like, I, I started this podcast and I haven't missed a Tuesday since I did. And I started the blog 10 years ago and yeah, it's come and gone. But over the last four or five years, I haven't missed a Thursday. Or I should say for the podcast, I haven't missed an every other Tuesday. I'm still in my own head trying to figure out why I continue these things. That I started them is so far behind me now. I still can't figure out why I continue. I, I'm crazy. I don't know. I feel like I have things to share. I, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out why I continue these things. So do you picture a day that you'll stop? And if you do stop, what's next? Yeah. So I, I discovered that the blog turns 10 this year. Because I what it's, I'm not a person who would ever pay attention to that. I'm not a birthday guy, right? Like, I don't celebrate those things. And I was doing math for something else, and went, "Oh my god, my blog turns ten. What?" And so, you you think about. Do I take a break? And and the same with the podcast. Podcast turns two. You think about 
do I take a break? I don't know what my life would be if I didn't have those rhythms. It's Thursday, the post goes out. Every other Tuesday, the po- the podcast goes out. And in between, I'm doing the editing and the the reaching out to future guests and all. like the the rhythms of those creations in a way have become the rhythms of my life. Now, unemployment has had a huge deal to that. This is all I do right now. Um at, when I'm not looking for something more sustainable. But I I wonder what's left. I'm let's put it this way. I'm afraid to stop cuz I don't know what happens. I'm not going to say like I'm a shark. I'm going to die if I stop, but I'm afraid what happens. Like do 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 I lose the energy? Like do I lose the momentum of just doing it, doing it, doing it? Or maybe there is something else. But at the moment, the honest answer is I'm too afraid to stop. And I'm having a pretty good time anyway. Is there, do you have an audience? Yeah, I mean, I have an audience. I, I, and I, I, I've cultivated a very, um, small following that like a small a small core following that then has like periphery so i know my my core blog audience and i know my core podcast audience and then you know depending on the guest or the topic it expands exponentially um but i i think maybe perhaps i'm still doing this for me um I I I know there are other blogs like mine out there and I know there are other podcasts that have conversations. Uh but I haven't found them that sound like this or that you know read like mine. So you know if if for nothing else this is for an audience of one, me. 